Good morning, Andre. Good morning, Bruno. Hello, Mikhail. Okay. Does my sound good here? Good morning. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Yeah. So I was preparing for my paper uh, this morning, and I just found out that my paper is tomorrow, not today. <laughs> so I have still time to prepare. <laughs> you still have more time. Yeah. yeah, well, the slides were made. I just wanted to to uh, to see if I could make it easier because it, uh, it was it's a bit crowded with data. I'll give it another round. Okay. OK, in the meantime, OK, chat is enabled for all participants. And I just uh, enabled attendees to view all questions, uh, even when they are not answered yet. So is Lucy around? No. Uh, she was not when I looked. And in Slack? No. Okay. Check if she's in Slack. No. No, Slack doesn't give you presence, it just tells you. Okay, I just ping the ring slack.
Hey, Lucia. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of uh, EAMT 2020. Um, it, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to host Lucia Spezia, our uh, invited speaker. Lucia Spezia is Professor of Natural Language Processing at Imperial College London. And she has also part-time appointments at the University of Sheffield and Dublin City University. Her research focuses on various aspects of data-driven approaches to language processing, with a special interest in uh, multimodal and multilingual context models, and work at the intersection of language and vision. Uh, Lucia's work has been applied to various tasks such as machine translation, image captioning, text adaptation, and quality estimation. She's also interested in making machine translation useful for end users, uh, where tools like quality estimation and automatic post editing play a big role. She's the recipient of uh, the multi MT ERC starting grant on multimodal machine translation running until 2021. And she's also, uh, she's currently involved uh, in projects uh, on in-browser machine translation and quality estimation, as well as multilingual referential grounding. Professor Specia will give now her keynote speech, uh, exploring neural machine translations, bag of tricks for translation quality estimation and evaluation. Lucia, the floor is, the floor is yours. 
Thanks, thanks, Michael. Um, morning, everyone, and thanks for having me, uh, even remotely. Uh, let me just share my screen. Right, can you see my screen? Right, Michael, you're muted, but I'm going to assume it's fine. Um, good. So, um, yeah, so what I wanted to uh, talk about today is a couple of ways in which we can use uh, information that comes from uh, NMT models themselves for quality assessment. And um, I will basically split this talk in two parts, as you'll see later, and uh, depending on how much time we actually have in the end. Um, so just let's start with some like, motivation. So we all know that uh, NMT is, is pretty good, uh, but yet not perfect. And so we still need to evaluate it in, in, in different ways. Um, when you're talking about system development or comparison, we normally do it using some test set which has some human translations as reference. So I'll refer to this as quality evaluation or generally MT evaluation. So this is reference-based evaluation. And for systems in use, when you don't have access to reference, uh, we also need quality estimation, so prediction of quality. Um, and, and we know that these models that we have nowadays, these transformer-based models, are, are quite powerful. They're very deep, uh, and they're trained in a lot of data. So the question that we asked ourselves was, uh, can we not take advantage of the models themselves and the information that it produces as tools for evaluation and estimation as well. And this is what this talk is going to be about. And in the first part, I'm going to cover how we explore uh, NMT information for what we call unsupervised and glass box quality estimation. And then in the second part, um, I'm going to talk about how we use it as a way of generating sort of references, um, and, and you see what I mean by that, uh, for quality evaluation. Uh, so let's let's get started with the quality estimation part. And before I actually talk about unsupervised work that we've been doing, just a couple of slides on, on where we are with quality estimation. We've just completed um, a, a, a round of the WMT shared task on this problem. Um, and so I can give you some very uh, up-to-date results. And uh, and this slide basically, slide basically summarizes sort of the, the, the state-of-the-art approach. And there's a, a number of them that use very similar techniques. I'm just mentioning the two that topped the leaderboard here, so the winning submissions. Um, and what they do is, is like with many other NLP tasks, they will take some very uh, powerful pre-trained embeddings, contextualized word, word embeddings in this case, um, uh, some large version of cross-lingual uh, Roberta. So XMR um, is one of the tools that allows us to do that. And, and then they extract some representations for both the source sentence and the target sentence. In this case, is the two sentences are, are concatenated. The target here is the empty uh, output. Um, and these are passed through this uh, uh, pre-trained embeddings and then uh, one single, uh, in this case, one single representation, which is the so-called CLS token, is then uh, 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 used with another output layer, which is trained as a, with regression to predict some continuous score. So this is standard in NLP nowadays, and it works fairly well for quality estimation as well. And I'm going to refer to this type of model as black box model, in the sense that it does not use any information from the NMT model that produces translations. It just takes the output translations, the source sentences, and then uh, uh, some quality labels and, and build the model on top of that. And you see later why this, this is important. Um, and, and if you look at, this is sort of a, a summary uh, of the leaderboard, just a stract of systems that outperform the baseline. Um, all of the systems are, are, are um, uh, basically trained on the same data, or um, we also had some unsupervised submissions, which are which are which are here. But regardless of that, this is shared task data, so they're all very comparable. And there's a number of language pairs here, as you see, and a variant at the very end, which is the multilingual, which is basically just the average uh, prediction for all of the the, the languages. 
And the, the two winning submissions, like I said, are the ones that use this powerful uh, pre-trained embeddings. And they basically almost double the performance of the baseline, which is also a neural model uh, where, but where the, the and, and follows a sort of a similar architecture, but the initial part, which is this embedding representations is not trained on a very large data set, but rather on the same data as that was used, that, that was used to train the NMT model. So this is, I mean, on, on the surface, it looks pretty good. We, we are able to do very well. I mean, there's a correlation figures. Um, so the closer to one, the better one is a cap. So for some languages that have 91, which is pretty high. Uh, for others, it's still a bit more challenging. Uh, English, German, English, Chinese, these are the so-called like, high uh, um, quality translation languages where the empty systems tend to be very good. So there's less room um, to detect a uh, 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 small variance in, in lack, of predict lack of quality there. I'll come back to this results later, but um, this was just to show you sort of where we are <clears throat> and, and, and to introduce sort of the caveat in this very uh, powerful uh, quality estimation models, which is, <clears throat> sorry, the fact that these models are very heavy, uh, resource intensive and generally slow, especially if you're doing CPU prediction. Uh, so the, the ones that I talked about have about uh, almost 600 million parameters. <clears throat> so there's a very deep, uh, this is because of the, the pre-trained representation, which uses in this case 24 uh, transformer uh, encoder layers, and uh, these layers have a large number of uh, tension heads and so on. <clears throat> and if you try and build a, a, one of these models using a decent GPU with 12 gigabytes of RAM, you just can't, you can't fit that in memory. And once you, if you manage to build these models, they're very large, so gigabytes in disk and in, in, in RAM to load them. And inference is, is relatively slow, and I'm talking here about uh, uh, a batch of one at a time, so more than uh, 100 or so milliseconds per sentence, which is um, far from ideal. And the fact that they're supervised, which is sort of a, 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 an orthogonal uh, caveat here, but it, it still is, means that they need quality label data in principle for each language and domain. And I put a question mark here because I'm going to show some zero shot results later that may indicate that this is not necessarily the case. And, um, but more important when it comes to this, that the size and the uh, efficiency of the models in general, they're not realistic for use in a lot of very uh, important use cases. And I'm going to just cover briefly two here. One is this Bergamot project where we're building in-browser machine translation and quality evaluation. So everything has to run on the user machine for privacy issues. And we can't assume that the users will have six gigabytes of memory of RAM just for that quality estimation model on top of the translation model that will be running there. Um, and another use case is, is uh, uh, for example, if you're translating on the fly, real time, say Facebook, runs their translation models on, on user posts. Um, you can't afford having the, the, the latency uh, for the translation to be generated. Um, it can't be batched, it has to be real time. Plus uh, you have hundreds of languages and language combinations, so you can't really, even if you have machines to host all of these models, it does become a, a problem in terms of the time to compute uh, uh, predictions. So based on this sort of a, um, uh, deficiencies or limitations of this uh, well-performing yet um, um, limited models, we, we came up with this idea of uh, trying to model this, uh, uh, the quality estimation task as, as, as on the one hand, um, what we call glass box, which means we are using NMT information itself rather than disparate trained representations. And then on the other hand, with unsupervised, uh, uh, with this idea of unsupervised learning, where we don't assume that we have label data. And later on, I'm going to talk about uh, variants of this where we do use label data, but we still rely on the NMT model only as a predictor. So let's start with the most extreme uh, end of the spectrum, which is there's no labels and uh, we don't use the actual text uh, that is produced, the translations or the source text. We just use some information that comes from the NMT model. Before I introduce that, just a few um, words on the data that we use, because this is also uh, quite new. Um, so this is data that we collected uh, for the WMT 2020 quality estimation task, but it's also 
uh, been used by uh, in a number of other papers. Um, so this is Wikipedia data. We used um, uh, NMT models uh, that are very state of the art to generate translations. Uh, we released the models as well as part of the, the task. We cover uh, uh, seven language pairs, including low resource, mid resource, and high resource. Uh, we annotate these translations with a sort of a variant of direct assessment, uh, so zero to 100 scores. And we also, for a subset of the data, we also have post editing. And it's quite sizable 10,000 sentences per language pair. So, altogether, uh, is, is the largest uh, data that we've collected of this type. And, and it's interesting just to, to talk about distribution of uh, direct assessment and HDR scores in this data, because it's quite different for different language pairs. You see, for, for Romania, which was a sort of one of the best performing one, you have a nice, and for Estonia, you have sort of a nice spread uh, over different quality labels, whereas for uh, German, uh, most of it is quite high quality. So towards the end, uh, Chinese is also high quality, and you have a bit of everything. So different language, not only in terms of uh, language families, but also coverage in terms of resources and quality uh, of the translations. Right, and, and a lot of the experiments that I'm going to show here, actually all of the experiments use this data. So let me get started with the um, unsupervised glass box quality estimation. So like I said before, this is the idea here is to use the NMT itself as a way of providing uh, quality indicators. Um, and, and there's a several advantages. Number one is that if you're doing this at the sentence level, um, we in principle don't need any label data unless you need to set up like a threshold for good bad quality, then we might need some, some, some label data. In principle, it's also like language and domain agnostic, and I'll show some uh, evidence of that later. And you don't need any additional resources, both in terms of data and uh, computation. So there is no additional prediction that is to be uh, made. Uh, and, um, and the types of um, information that we explore from the NMT model uh, can vary. And I'm going to cover two of them in the paper, which uh, uh, we published in the tackle. We, we also talk about attention weights as a way of, uh, uh, of, as a proxy for quality, but that doesn't perform very well. So I'm going to talk about very simple uh, output uh, probability distribution indicators and then indicators that try and, and model the uncertainty of the NMT model. So as a sort of underlying model, uh, it's not too important uh, the details. We just assume some sequence to sequence probabilistic NMT model. We used uh, uh, transformers for that. Uh, but again, because we, we, as long as it's a probabilistic model and you get a distribution for every uh, token that is produced, that's all we care about. And, and given that we have this probability uh, uh, distribution as output, the simplest thing that we can do uh, and, and use as a proxy for, for quality is sort of the, if you, if you want the confidence of the NMT model on every token that it outputs. So this is what we refer to, this is just the log probability of the predicted tokens. We're doing this at the sentence level. So all we're doing is, here is averaging the probability for the tokens um, over the entire sentence. So it's, it's a sequence uh, as output. Um, and, and that is just saying, if, if the system is, is confident in predicting the token that it has predicted uh, with a high probability, then we assume that this is a high quality uh, prediction. Um, and here we're only looking at the top prediction for this particular indicator, which um, has been shown in previous work is not sort of ideal because NMT models as other neural models can be overconfident and in that uh, they might be very certain at a certain word is this is the most likely word, but it's still the incorrect word. But this is, this is sort of a baseline that we use. <clears throat> a slightly better uh, variant of that is to actually look at the entropy of the, the probability distribution that is produced. So not only the top uh, this, uh, probability, but the distribution over the entire vocabulary. So here we're basically averaging uh, for all of the, the, the tokens, uh, but also for all of the tokens in, in the sentence, but also for all of the tokens in the vocabulary. And, and the uh, idea here is that if most of the probability mass is concentrated 
on a few of the vocabulary words, then the target word that is generated is likely to be correct. Meaning if it's, it's, it's not a very uh, flat distribution, then we have, basically we have a little bit more information on that. Um, and finally, we also look at the actual uh, tokens that are produced uh, as, as, as the, the output, not just the, the, fig, the number of the probability of the token, but the tokens uh, um, uh, themselves. And this, um, the idea here is, is, um, is basically we're looking at the sequence of tokens here and it's to try and, and, and uh, model the fact that in some cases you have the same overall distribution. For example, if you only have uh, two tokens here, you could have uh, a, a distribution of 0, 1 and 0, 9 versus half and half. And this, on average, they will be the same, but in practice, it could be very different because in this case, the first model is very is a lot more certain of one of these uh, uh, possible tokens. So we also look at this uh, uh, so sort of standard deviation over this uh, the dispersion of the token level probabilities. And these are all things that come entirely as a byproduct of the NMT model. We don't have to do anything other than capture this, uh, either the actual probability or the distribution uh, of the probabilities, and then maybe do some simple computations on top of that. Um, so this is sort of, uh, again, correlation on those uh, same language pairs that I showed before. And um, I will bring back the state of the art results at some point so that you see where this sits there. But let's just start with the, with the, with the intermediate results for now. Um, so the top one here is our sort of baseline. If we only look at the probability of the produced token, the top token by the NMT model. And it, I mean, the numbers show that it takes us some way. Um, it's, it's not close to zero. It's, it's in, for some languages, it seems to be you know, Quite, uh, well, high enough uh, on, on, on first inspection at least. Uh, and, and then there is a bit of a, 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 it is not a very clear trend on which of these indicators perform better. And this is perhaps to do with uh, how well trained the NMT model is. So for the lower resource uh, languages, uh, clearly the, the only looking at the top uh, uh, prediction here doesn't do uh, very well. And this is probably because it's not trained well enough because there isn't a lot of data for these languages, Sinhala and Nepalese. For the high resource languages, it could be overtrained. So the predictions are a bit overconfident because it's it's a bit maybe overfit. Uh, whereas for the mid resource languages, it seems to work uh, well enough. So in other words, the actual uh, um, uh, the performance will also depend on uh, the training of the NMT uh, models and, and for those who, who know a bit about model calibration, this is also related to how well calibrated these models will be, which is often a consequence of, of the amount of training data uh, and how well trained the model is. Uh, but overall, this this indicates that uh, uh, this simple uh, um, NMT information might not be sufficient. And uh, more specifically, that it might not be capturing uh, the actual um, true confidence of, uh, of the predictions. Uh, it, it we'll actually distinguish this idea of confidence and certainty. Um, and, and the model, like I said before, could be very confident and still produce bad, uh, uh, bad translations. Um, so what we, what we did next is to actually look at ways of capturing uh, uh, this uncertainty in slightly more principled ways. And I'm gonna introduce this sort of the, the idea of uncertainty and why it relates to quality a bit better. Um, so the, 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 the idea is that um, if the model is very certain on the prediction, it's because the prediction is good. Now, how you capture this certainty is, is, is a challenge. So the, 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 the indicators that I showed so far uh, don't really capture certainty, but to some extent, the confidence of the model. So what we wanna do is to try and capture the certainty of the model, which might not be exactly the same as confidence if the model is not well uh, trained. Um, and maybe that will become clear as I introduce the ways in which we capture this uh, uh, uncertainty. 
Um, so if you wanted to do it in a very, very principled way, then the only way to go is using Bayesian frameworks, which is uh, uh, where instead of uh, doing point estimates for the, 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 the token predictions, we would do um, probability distributions over those. And then we would use posterior over the parameters to compute the uncertainty uh, or to estimate uncertainty at interest time. However, this is prohibitive, as, as we all know, with, uh, with deep neural networks, introducing uh, Bayesian uh, reasoning there is, is possible, but it's, um, it's very costly. So what people have uh, done in the past is to approximate this Bayesian approaches in different ways. And we, I'm only going to cover one of these ways in the presentation, which is actually a very, very uh, popular way. Uh, and it's you use Monte Carlo uh, or MC dropout. So this is a very, very simple technique and people are probably familiar with the idea of dropout <clears throat> at training time, which is <clears throat> the idea of masking some neurons to make the model less likely to overfit to the, to the data. So when it comes to um, using that for uh, modeling uncertainty, we actually only do that at inference time. So the models might are likely to be trained with dropout as well, which is actually a good thing for this purpose, but we don't do anything. We don't change anything uh, in terms of the actual training procedure uh, or we don't retrain the model or anything. All we do is to apply this already trained NMT model um, with a, a different, different runs. So we do different forward passes of the network and, and we apply dropout at every uh, pass uh, with the same rate, let's say 0 point whatever 3. And, and this will mean that some of the neurons will be uh, uh, masked or zeroed. Um, and this will result in a different predictive uh, uh, distribution um, and often also in a different output, which we'll come, I'll come back to in a minute. And then we use this various uh, or this, this differences in the predictive distribution as uncertainty. And the intuition here is that if, if, you, if you mask some of the, 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 the neurons and you do that a number of times, say 10 times or 30 times, um, and the distribution is still similar, um, or, or in all of these runs, the distribution is similar, it's an indication that the model is, is actually more certain of, of its uh, underlying uh, uh, estimates. And, and also if the generated output is similar over all of these K forward passes, it could be an indication that the model is actually certain of its uh, predictions. And we use this, this sort of intuition as a way of capturing uncertainty. Um, Right, so this is just a representation of uh, yeah, what dropout is, is, is doing at, at test time, but uh, we all know it's just zeroing some of the neurons and as a consequence, the actual distribution could be different and the output could be different as well. So we use this, uh, this intuition in, in basically two ways. Um, the first one is to look at the variation in the actual distributions over this k passes of the neural network um, and and that's just the mean of this uh, uh, the, the tp is is it the distribution of the top prediction here so every pass you do you have a different top prediction and that for all of the words and and, and uh, in the sentence so we just take the mean over all of the words and then over all of the passes and and the second one is where we actually um, run this uh, multiple passes to generate different translations. So, so in the first one, we don't actually need to generate different translations. We're actually just scoring the same translation. So we take one top translation and uh, we, we fix it. It's like a forced decoder approach, uh, but every, and we run different forward passes. And every time we have, uh, well, we have dropouts, so every time different neurons will be zeroed. Uh, and, and then we just use that to score this already produced top translation uh, or, or, or main translation. Um, and, in, in, and this is this DTP, which you see again and again. Um, and in the, the, the second case here, the lex similarity, we're actually running the K, uh, uh, running the inference uh, um, K times, but every time we generate a different translation. And then we're looking at similarity, the, lex, the, the word similarity, basically the string similarity between the different hypotheses. 
And similarity here can be different things. We use Meteor in this, in this results that I'm going to present. Um, and essentially, we are computing sort of the pairwise uh, similarities between all of the different translations that are generated in the k-passes and then taking the average of that or the mean of that. So this, both these uh, uh, indicators perform much better than, uh, than the simpler uh, um, uh, output distribution indicators um, for all of the language pairs. Again, we have a bit of a challenge with the high resource ones here, uh, but this do better than with the, the, the previous uh, indicators by a little bit. But in the other cases, uh, in the other languages, it does much better. And, and, and to us, this is a good indication that uh, um, we're capturing some model uncertainty. And just to give you an idea of what this means in practice, uh, this is uh, an example uh, from our data from Estonian to uh, English, where um, I would drop out here, I'm just showing the top of the four first passes of the decoder uh, generating different translations. And NBES here is if you were to take the NBES output from your Bing uh, search without any uh, uh, dropout uh, at inference time. So at NBES, you see that uh, there's a lot of repetition. And even when there is variation, uh, it's, it's generally just one word here and there. Whereas with dropout, we're getting very different hypotheses. And this is a good, this is a case of a good quality MT. So the MT at the top here is the, the one uh, hypothesis without any dropout. And you see that these are basically good paraphrases of it, um, which are all, are all like good, good enough translations. On the other hand, if you take a case where the initial MT is, is fairly bad, and if you compare this to the reference, uh, there is a silver thread and candle from Tanzeri, it's, it's very different from the actual reference. Uh, and you do the same, you do this uh, several passes of the decoder with drop out, you get very different hypotheses. And I'm not showing here the actual uh, distribution of uh, the, well, the probabilities that you get for this uh, hypothesis, but they are also very different. Uh, and if you're doing this with NBES, you get all the same things. So, so this is definitely uh, uh, indicating that when the model produces different hypotheses with dropout and also different scores, which I'm not showing, uh, it's likely that the model is not uh, producing good translation. And this is the same model in both cases here, it's the same English, uh, sorry, Estonian English model. And, and just as a, as a way of comparison, I'm showing here the official uh, baseline that was used in this uh, quality estimation task, uh, which is this predictor estimator. And, and this is a supervised model, which is first pre-trained on, on the same data as the NMT model, and then fine-tuned on, the on the training data for quality estimation here. And interestingly, we can see that our completely unsupervised uh, indicators perform better uh, for pretty much all of the language pairs with no, no additional supervision other than that what comes from the NMT model itself, which is fairly promising. And I'll come back to that table. Uh, I'll, I'll keep adding to it so we can keep talking about it. So um, it's, it's um, th this results which are promising um, essentially led us to think, okay, can, how can we improve them? And one, one uh, possible way to improve that is to add some supervision, uh, but still not go into this complex, heavy, expensive neural models. So this is what I'm calling supervised glass box quality estimation. So glass box in the sense that it's still using NMT information, supervised in the sense that we're using labels, but again, not using any, any other uh, neural model here. And, and that would help us to uh, improve models, uh, but also if we needed to find a decision boundary, if we needed to decide at both sentence or even word level uh, on whether a prediction represents a good or a bad translation, we'll need to threshold the, this indicator somehow. Um, and then finally, because these indicators seem to be giving us different information, so why not combine them? And if you combine them, you need to learn weights for these indicators uh, somehow. Um, so this is what we did. We, we, we used some very simple uh, uh, regressors. In this case, the results are with the random forest regression, but you could use pretty much anything here. It doesn't really matter that much because we're combining a handful of, uh, uh, um, I don't know, 30 or so 
indicators um, and, and, um, and the model doesn't need to be complex for that. Um, this also includes this bit that I didn't cover, which is the uh, some information on the attention uh, weights. Um, and if you want, you can ask me later about it. Uh, so this is the final uh, row in this table. And as you can see, it outperforms anything that was out there um, in terms of uh, uh, both unsupervised and supervised uh, uh, models, and by a large uh, margin in some cases. Um, and still, it's a very light model. Um, now, if we go back to the big table that I showed in the beginning and just add here at the bottom the best performing system at the WMT uh, task, which is a supervised heavyweight neural model, there's still a significant gap between between them. And then also I should uh, uh, note that this supervised model, there's a lot of assembling as well, which obviously adds to the cost of uh, uh, quality prediction here. Um, so for some languages, the gap is larger, like for, for, the, for the, the tricky ones, the high resource ones, the gap is not as big as for the other ones. Um, and and so there's still a way to go and there's some, some work that we've been doing on trying to bridge this gap. But I think this, this GB regression here, which is a fairly, an extremely simple model, which is only taking NMT information and then sort of combining that through some supervision is, is very good. And what I'll show later is that the amount of supervision is, can be very small. And before, before I do that, just a, a, a little bit more details on the, how heavy the models are. I mentioned that in the beginning, but this is a, is a, is a slightly more detailed comparison. And what I wanted to show here is that um, the size of the pre-trained representation uh, matters a lot in performance. Not only it makes the model bigger, so all of the results that I've been showing are with the Roberta Large, which is this XLMR model um, and very, very large models, those of parameters. Uh, performance is pretty good. This is without ensembling. But if you compare uh, some of the slightly smaller versions of that, which are still very big, such as Roberta Bayes, you see that the score that we're getting with this GB regression is actually better than that. So, so what's making a difference in this uh, uh, high performing quality estimation models is really the size of the pre-trained representation and the assembly that's put on top, which I'm not too interested in. Um, right, so let me just talk a little bit about amount of training data, uh, because like I said, this, this new uh, MLQV data set has, uh, we use 7,000 uh, samples for training. Uh, but then the obvious question is, do we need all of that, especially if we're going for this lightweight uh, uh, regression models? So we plot learning curves for both the best WMT model and this regression model, and they behave quite similarly. Uh, English, German is an exception here, as it is for pretty much everything that we tried, and I can talk more about why this is the case. It's mostly a data, data issue than a language issue. Um, but essentially, with 30 to 50% of the data, uh, you get 100% of the performance. And in some cases, even with the, about 20%, it's enough for both types of models. So, so it, it's, it's, it's also promising because if you get maybe then 1,000 samples annotated per language pair, that is enough. Another thing that we did, which I find quite interesting, is to look at how these different models, the heavy black box models versus the glass box one, perform when you have no information about a specific language, so the zero, sh zero shot cases. And for that, uh, we did uh, various experiments where we train on a specific language pair and we test on all of the others. And the diagonal here would be the actual train and test on the same language pair, so that you would expect the best possible performance. And the other cells are showing either uh, increase or decrease in performance in absolute terms here. So as you can see, for example, for this is the black box one for English Chinese. If you train and test in that language, you get the best uh, correlation. Uh, if you if you train um, for Chinese and you test uh, in Romanian, you get almost uh, I mean you get almost a. Uh, uh, close to zero correlation compared to training in Romania and testing in Romania. So you would expect that to happen. Uh, 
performance to decrease in, in most cases. And this is certainly the case with the black box models because they're using language specific information. Remember, they're taking these pre-trained embeddings and then doing something with, with the word uh, embeddings that comes, uh, the sentence representation that comes from the word embeddings from this pre-trained representation. So we would expect that to happen. However, if we look at the GB uh, uh, regression models, we see that this is less so the case. Um, and as you remember, the um, um, let's just look at the same language pair here. So English Chinese tested on English Chinese, very similar performance. So we had 47, here's 44. And tested in any of the lang other languages, the decrease is much, much uh, lower. So we don't get a, a lot of drop in performance in the zero shot cases. Um, and in some cases, actually, you get an increase. And, and again, this is the outlier English German here. But, but, but the bottom line is that these models, these glass box models, tend to be more language independent, which is a big plus if, if you're building multilingual models. And in, in the paper that we published here, we also have a version where we, we basically train on all languages together and then test in, in, in each of these languages. So we have a multilingual model and the performance is, is, is the trend is the same here. So this is this is good for glass box uh, indicators. Right, let me just wrap up this, this part. Uh, the second part is, is shorter. Uh, don't worry, I don't have 65 slides. Um, and uh, um, so overall, these indicators from the NMT model provide rich information, which is competitive to supervise models, not to the very state-of-the-art one models, but for for reasons that I explained uh, um, to do with the pre-trained representations and assembly. And estimating the predictive uncertainty through things like MC dropout is a better idea <clears throat> than just taking the distributions from the MT, NMT model itself. Um, I haven't showed this, but you can ask me questions later. Uh, that this, this results also vary depending on the type of NMT system that we use. Um, standard transformer versus a, a mixture of experts and so on. I can talk about that later. And even though the results are behind the heavy supervised approach, uh, we should look at this from the perspective of, of uh, also applying these models in practice and they're simple, light and, and cheap. And um, if you add a bit of supervision in the glass box supervised approaches, then you get a good compromise uh, between uh, uh, cost of building a model through some supervision and, and the efficiency of this model. So <clears throat> let, let me now talk about um, the second part of the presentation, which is how can we use NMT models also to help with reference-based evaluation? And I'm going to start in the same way as I did with quality estimation, which is introducing a sort of state of the art in, in this area. So as we all know, with reference based evaluation, what we do is we, we get the MT output to compare it to a reference or human translation using some, some similarity metric. There's hundreds of these metrics. There's a nice survey if you're interested. And the state of the art, if we have to pick one metric, um, would be a metric that relies, again, on pre-trained uh, uh, embeddings. Bird score is a good example. It performs really well for translation and many other language generation tasks. And it's, it's extremely simple. So all of the limit, all of the criticisms that uh, other metrics that try to replace flu head, uh, bird score to a large extent uh, addresses them. Uh, the only constraint is that you need to have this good pre-trained representations for that. For the languages that you, or the target language that you are um, evaluating, but we have that for for a lot of languages nowadays. So um, this is this is a standard procedure. We also know, and uh, there have been a number of papers showing that um, there is a there are issues of comparing the MT uh, output to references, especially if it's one single reference. Uh, there's a so-called reference bias problem. Um, we know that there are multiple possible translations that the system could produce and expecting that it will match one or even a couple of references is maybe not realistic. Uh, and as a consequence, the metrics can harshly penalize correct MT output. And in some cases, reference can be wrong. And we've seen that over and over again. Uh, so there's been some work on trying to address that um, by uh, 
proposing that metrics that will relax the match in, in different ways, for example, with synonyms, uh, we're looking at character level matching or looking at uh, embeddings, uh, embedding level matching instead, instead of a, a string matching. Um, and, and but that's that's what we, we, we claim and what we'll show a bit later is that this is still not enough. Um, another possible direction to, to address this problem, the reference bias problem, is to use multiple references. And there has been a lot of work showing that pretty much any metric will benefit from it. However, it's expensive to compute that. And there's some old work where one used uh, uh, MT systems to produce different references, which is, which is a possible direction, but then you need multiple MT systems. And, and uh, um, then you have to think about whether the additional empty systems are better uh, than yours, uh, or if they're worse, then it shouldn't work as, as, as reference. So this doesn't work so well in practice. So what, what we proposed, which is uh, extremely simple, and it was actually a byproduct of the first part of the work, which uh, um, we just came up with by observing how good paraphrases the NMT model was generating, is this idea of instead of multiple references, looking at multiple hypotheses uh, evaluation. So we're sort of flipping the, the interpretation of the problem. So instead of uh, the original way, which would be let's get as many references as possible, sort of more costly way, by let's, let's just stick to the one reference that we have and produce multiple empty outputs using same technique that I mentioned before, which I'll come back to, uh, and use this not as pseudo-reference, but as a way of, again, trying to understand how certain the MT model is of the translations it produced. So let's look at uh, how we do that. And there's basically three, three steps. One is how do we generate this multiple hypothesis? The second is what do we compare in this evaluation? We have the MT, so we have the MT output, we have the reference, and we have all of these hypotheses. What are we comparing against what? And the third is how we're we comparing it. What, what's the similarity function? So let's look at uh, these three items. Uh, so the first one is exactly the same thing as I mentioned before. So we use this MC dropout. Uh, so there's multiple passes of the decoder uh, with a dropout rate, and we get different hypotheses as, as, as a consequence. And, and we can do that uh, in, in our experiments. We did it uh, 30 times. Uh, if you do it 10 times, it's pretty much it's the same. We, we did that afterwards and we observed that it's the same. And the hypothesis is the same as we had before, but now in the context of reference-based evaluation. So this is just uh, what we expect is that with a, a bad MT output, uh, you would get uh, the, sort of the, the output that you want to evaluate. So there's always one main MT output, which is this green triangle here. Um, you have the reference, so if it's a bad MT output, it's far, uh, but also the hypothesis will be far from this uh, uh, MT output. So the, the every pass will generate a very different hypothesis, and there's also far from the reference. Whereas with a, a good MT output, um, it might be different from the reference, so it's still uh, quite far from the, the, the red dot there. But uh, I have a number of alternatives which are very close to it, generated by the same NMT model. And this is, I'm going to go back to the same example as I had before. This is exactly as what we observe when you look at the data. With good MT output, uh, all of these uh, alternatives are very similar, whereas with bad MT output, the alternatives are very different, linguistically speaking. Now, we're not looking at the scores anymore. Uh, we, we, we have some exploration in the paper where we did, did look at the scores, but in this case, we're just looking at the actual generated outputs. So, um, right, so we generate outputs with dropout, um, and then what do we compare? So we tried a number of uh, approaches here, and I'm just going to talk about three of them. Um, in two of them, we still use the reference, so the original reference, um, and in another one, we don't. So let's start with the first one, which is the idea of comparing um, the multiple hypotheses against the reference. Um, and, and by hype here, I mean all of the different things that I get with the, the different passes of the decoder. And by empty, I mean the original uh, empty output that I want to score. 
and reference is the one reference. So what we're doing is just basically taking the average between the similarity be between the reference and the empty output and the similarity between the reference and every single hypothesis. We have multiple of this. Um, and this helps us capture uh, um, uh, possible translation variations. And the second approach, we are uh, comparing the hypothesis against the empty, not against the reference. So we still have uh, empty and reference. So this is sort of a, the standard. If, if you were to do standard evaluation, the last, the second component here would be all we have. But we're also comparing uh, the variance or, or analyzing the variance between the different hypotheses generated by the MT uh, system. Um, and, and then taking the average of that. And then finally, we also test a case where let's get rid of the reference. So this becomes reference less evaluation. And all we do is compare the different hypotheses that are generated by the MT system, including the main hypothesis, so the MT here and the various ones that we get with the, the K passes of the, the network. And so we're just doing a pairwise comparisons here. Um, and as similarity metrics, so I have this sim in, in all of the cases as similarity metric. Again, we try different metrics. I'm gonna show results with three of them. So our favorite uh, sentence level blue, uh, Meteor, which is already a relaxed sort of a, a matching metric. And then finally, the, the, the state-of-the-art bird score. Um, as data, we use a, a subset of the ML Kiwi data, the Estonian English, for which we had two references. Uh, so for this, we need we need a DA annotation as a way of measuring correlation with the, with the metrics, but also we need uh, references, obviously. And in this case, we had two independently collected references. In the paper, we also show experiments with a, a, a WMT data set, um, but I'm only gonna cover this one here. Um, and and the, the figures that I'm showing here are Pearson correlation with the direct assessment uh, human uh, score uh, for the sentences. And um, the blue bars here are the standard MT evaluation where I um, only have one MT hypothesis and one uh, or multiple references, multiple here means two. Um, and again, the higher the number, the better. And all of the green bars are the three alternatives that I've just explained. And remember the, the last, uh, sorry, the middle one, hype itself, is where we don't have reference at all. We're only looking at uh, the different um, uh, MT uh, outputs, the top one and the different hypotheses. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is with blue as similarity metric. Uh, so we get uh, improvements over multiple references, which is pretty uh, good. Uh, if we do that with Meteor, it's the same. Um, and uh, uh, we get a, a large jump, even with multiple references. And if we do that with bird score, the jump is not as high as we did expect. And actually bird score came, was published while we, we were writing the final, the camera ready version of this paper almost. Uh, but we managed to add it, and but we still get some improvement uh, compared to the multi reference setup and, and significant improve, improvement compared to a single reference, which is sort of the standard. So, this is the bar that we should be paying attention to because in most evaluation settings, we don't have two references, we only have one. So, we get a, a good jump there. Um, but also, uh, even if we look at this, this hype self here, it's a little bit better or the same like this in the numbers as comparing to the reference. And this to me is very promising. So it means you could actually stop looking at the reference and just look at the certainty of the model as a way of evaluating itself. All right, just wrapping up and I'm almost done. Um, so we, we see that in, in, in this and the other data set that we have in the paper, uh, um, this multi-hypothesis uh, uh, regime outperforms the standard MT evaluation even if you have multiple references um, and um, even if very strong metrics are used uh, uh, with speed training embeddings as a, as a way of comparison and as a similarity metric here. Um, and, and the variation among hypotheses, which doesn't use the reference is a very strong contender here. So we should, we should be looking at it uh, when we don't have references. Um, and the, the, 
this idea of comparing uh, the hypothesis, sorry, the empty output to the, the alternative hypothesis is also very powerful. It allows us to address the acceptable variation compared to the reference, um, but also the, the model uncertainty, uh, which as, as I showed is, is a good indicator of uh, quality. So just some general conclusions. Um, so overall, I think this, I hope you're convinced with this, this two sort of lines of work that uh, an empty predictive uncertainty through approximations such as dropout um, are very useful for different tasks and we get that information sort of for free. And now I know there'll be the questions, yeah, but you still need to do multiple forward passes of the decoder, but that can be quite cheap. Um, especially if you're just doing that for scoring the translation rather than generating translations in comparison with training a different model on top of that or with collecting multiple references for evaluation. Um, so I've been working on different fronts on how to improve this work. One of them is the obvious like, combination of this glass box indicators with uh, strong neural models. So if, if the goal is just to push the performance rather than to make them uh, uh, light and uh, applicable and efficient. Uh, we, we can do that by adding these indicators to, to existing models. Uh, we've been looking at different types of uncertainty. Uh, um, so dropout is, is one approximation. There are other things that we can look at. On the other front, we've been trying to distill this very powerful uh, neuro QE models uh, to sort of find this balance between performance and efficiency. It's not an easy task. The moment you start distilling it, performance drops significantly, as I showed earlier, and then it's worse than a, a regression model. You're just using glass box indicators. Um, so it's not clear that we can actually effectively distill QE models. Been working on applying this for word level prediction as well, which is a little bit more challenging because when you average this uh, predictive uncertainty over sentences, it's more meaningful than when you look at specific tokens. Um, and finally, uh, on whether still a big question that we're trying to answer with this Bergamoth project is how and whether these predictions actually help uh, end users in practice and in this case is end users for gisting purposes rather than post editing purposes. That's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Lucia. Uh, <laughs> this left about five minutes for questions. Uh, we already have uh, one. Uh, so there's a question that says, you mentioned that NMT produces a good variety of translation hypotheses. Uh, did you do some special trick to get more diverse translations or does it just come out like this, like drop out in inference decoding? We haven't done anything uh, different. This is just a standard uh, transform model trained with the, um, the usual uh, procedure. This is a fair sake model. Um, we have played with different uh, NMT models where you might expect to get more uh, variance in the predictions, but this is not the results that I presented here. So in principle, no, you don't have to do uh, anything other than uh, masking some of these neurons at inference time to get this paraphrases. Okay, so while other questions come up, I had a question about the value of K that you use when you do drop out repeats. Mm -hmm. uh, What's what the value of K you use, or what's the, I don't remember. I probably so, so in in the paper we actually use thirty, which is seems quite high. But then we did some ablation afterwards, and we get the same same results with ten. So if you do ten forward passes, it's enough. So basically, ten inference ten inference passes uh, gives you this. Would give you results similar to what the ones you showed? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, which also means with ten uh, hypotheses, uh, you'd get yeah enough to replace the reference in many cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm not getting any more questions. Please uh, go to the Q&A um, uh, thing down behind the, uh, in your screen and just ask questions to our... In the meantime, could you, could you uh, clarify uh, the difference that you showed in the beginning between certainty and confidence? Because there are basically two different things. And uh, I mean, it kind of makes sense in real life too. Um, yeah, I mean, and then this is, um, I mean, this is where the, the, 
the trick is like how do you actually capture uh, certainty uh, versus uh, confidence and and there's um, in our paper we mentioned a bunch of uh, directions and, and people have looked at this for uh, MT but also for other problems um, and and yeah what when when normally when you talk about certainty you're talking about Bayesian uh, inference uh, approaches or some approximation of this and um, and there isn't a good way I mean with, with NMT especially, there isn't a good way of, of, of capturing that yet. And that's why you have this uh, various uh, approximations for that. But I think, yeah, if, if, you, if you are able to really have uh, predictions over distributions rather than over uh, point estimates, this would give you very useful information for various things, not just on the quality, but on, on improving the models themselves. So if you had, a, if you had that, then you would have a very well calibrated uh, an MT model, which then potentially would mean that translation would be a, a lot better, but also the, the, the actual predicted, uh, the, the, the probabilities that are prediction, predicted would be a lot more meaningful. You could use them as, as, as quality uh, predictors directly, but that is hard to implement. Um, so yeah. I mean, I have, we have a we good... got some late coming questions now for you. Yeah. Uh, let's see if we can take one. Uh, there was one by uh, Marta Bat Baritska. She says, uh, it's a question about studying the utility of quality estimation predictions in practice. Uh, and she asks, shall that, shall that study aim at determining if machine translation can be used as is or at assessing its usability for post editor? Sorry, was the question on, on whether there is a study or? Yeah, you, you have this uh, in the last slide. You had yeah. uh, like All right, yeah. Yeah. So in our case, so currently our interest is, is on, on um, end users who are using translations more for gisting purposes. Hmm. So, so the quality predictions would be either word level or sentence level as a way of um, sort of a alerting them to potentially incorrect translations. Uh, this could be in the sort of in-browser translation setting where, uh, say, you, you're running your, your uh, local translation model or on some data that you received by email or the language that you don't speak, or you're actually producing a translation that you want to send. Um, so the, but the setting is, is, doesn't assume that uh, the standard sort of post-editing uh, setting, but rather more of a gisting uh, use case. Same with the with say uh, producing translations on on, on Facebook uh, for end users who might not read the source sentence, uh, so it'd be the, the case of highlighting either words or given a, a sort of a score for different sentences um, or color coding, and this is something that uh, colleagues in in the Bergman project are now studying. Um, so there's some initial results there in this use case of in browser translation are that. Um, if you if you do it at the word level, it's more useful. Uh, it's more informative, uh, but obviously the predictions have to be good enough. So we've done that with gold predictions, not not with uh, system output predictions. Um, and in that case, word level seems to be the preferred way uh, that users uh, have to to, and that they find useful. I'm sorry, we'll have to, to end it up here. I'm sorry, because we had questions from Fabio and Dragos and Miguel and Laura. I, I'm, 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 I'm sure you will be able to reach uh, Lucia in some way through Slack or and other questions there because we're eating into our poster session. So thank you very much, everyone. It was a very nice talk and uh, I'm sorry that we didn't take all the questions. So we uh, end this session and remember that you have another link now for the poster session that should have started already. Thank you very much.